So, hello everybody. Um, nice to, to, to be here and um, I'm um, sitting right in the middle of Germany. So um, here in Germany right now it's 3 p.m. So um, good morning to the US and uh, good afternoon or good evening to everybody who is more Eastern. So um, what I want to talk today um, is maybe something new for you um, and it's called uh, the stable tissue concept. Um, that's me in my office where I'm sitting right now. Um, I have to admit the picture uh, was taken 10 years ago. I was much younger by then. So nowadays I got much more wrinkles. The beard got longer and longer beard means automatically wiser. So, and that's what uh, I really got over the last 10 years wiser because um, we understood a lot more about biology. We uh, have more tools from um, the companies in the office now that makes our life real easy or much easier. So everybody is nowadays talking about the zero bone loss concept. So don't get me wrong, Thomas Linkevitsios, he's a friend of mine, he's a great dentist and his concept is really, really cool. But I'm not sure um, whether he's completely right um, because uh, he says that you can have zero bone loss with every implant system in the world. And I'm not sure whether this is right. So that's the reason um, why we put instead of zero bonus the stable tissue concept because the implant system is one of our um, major issues in the concept and this is um, probably much uh, most of the magic that we can create nowadays with this concept because um, if you look at this paper here um, it's um, a little more than 10 years old um, and those guys who wrote the paper, they took implants, um, I would not have taken by that time because this is an implant with an external hex and we know that those implants just do not work. They create those um, saturation defects and um, I'm pretty much su sure that you can have zero bone loss uh, with that type of implant. Um, this is a study, uh, probably, or maybe some of you guys know Paul Weigel from the University of Frankfurt. Um, a couple of years ago, he came up with this study. And of course, um, when you have no load on your implant, there's absolutely no gap. So um, when we talk about gaps, we have to talk about implant systems um, who do not show any gaps. And um, those are implant systems with a conical connection. So let's see whether the gap has any influence. And uh, we know since more than 20 years from the study of Joe Herman, um, that we have to discuss that point. Okay, what he did, he put um, on the in the test group um, some implants where he welded um, the abutment with um, a def defined um, gap formation to the implant body, and then the test group, um, the control group, he just screwed those abutments um, also with the defined gap formation to the implant body. And he found out that the uh, micro gap does not have any influence because um, all implants of the non welded group had significantly increased amount of crestal bone loss. The um, group with the welded, the laser welded um, um, abutments did not show any um, bone loss. And, what he says is that um, the um, gap does not influence uh, the bone loss at all. It's the movement, the mobility of the abutment, what causes the bone loss. And we know that since more than 20 years. So um, for sure, we should make uh, some thoughts about the implant system we know because um, we know, I already told you a couple of minutes ago that conical um, um, connections of uh, the implant has superiority. We have, of course, um, better results um, in terms of abutment fit, the stability, and the seal performance. So look at here, this is the study from Paul Weigel again, 
um, he used in the study um, about joint connection, so a flat to flat connection. And what happens is when you load the implant, the gap is getting bigger and bigger the higher the load gets. I just told you that the gap that the gap does not have any influence, but the gap in this case means that you have mobility in your abutment and therefore you have bone loss. So um, I'm talking with a lot of dentists and when I talk about the issue, um, um, conical connection, they, they came up and say, hey Kai, my implant system does have a conical connection as well. So look at all those implants, they do have a conical connection, but you can't compare um, the, the, the conical connection with the one I'm talking about. So those here with the ankylo system is a yeah, small um, angle, but look at the bio horizon angle, it's 45 degrees. So it's still a conical connection, but that's not the conical connection I'm talking about. The conical connection I want to talk about is here shown in the organ system. The, the implant is called K3 Pro. Um, I think um, a lot of people in the US know the system. And um, this is the system I want to talk today. Um, let's not talk about um, the surface and let's not talk about the threads. Um, I hope and I'm sure you all agree that most of the implants, the modern implant systems in the world today, they heal pretty much in because uh, we had enough research in um, the outline of the implant and, and the surface, so that will heal. So when I talk about an implant, the only thing what matters for me is the inside of the implant, the connection. And um, we have here a special connection. This is a Morse taper conical connection and the Morse taper was developed to secure uh, tool components in the spindle of a tool and it's mostly characterized by the taper angle of a maximum of 1.5 degrees. So this is a self-locking conical connection. What are the benefits of the Morse taper connection? Um, we have two implant systems in the world with a Morse taper, a real Morse taper, and um, one of them is the organ system. The other one is Bicon. This is a really good um, implant as well, but um, it has some problems when you get to the prosthetic parts. So um, what's the difference between um, Bicon and our system? We have an index inside, so we have no trouble with the prosthetics at all. It's indexed you can really have some really, really precise prosthetic work going on there. Um, I told you that the more stable connection is a really, really stable connection. It's self-locking. So um, there is no force on the screw once the abutment sits in place. So um, afterwards, you could even remove the screw from the abutment and it will stay in place. We have absolutely no micro motion. That's what I talked about. And that's the reason for having bone loss or having no bone loss. And because we have no micro motion, we do not have any titanium abrasion. And that's um, a point for me as well, because in Germany, it's a big issue because um, yeah, more and more people think that they are allergic or they got hypersensitivities. So you have to talk about uh, titanium abrasion in other systems. So, and we have absolutely no microgrip. Even I told you that the microgrip doesn't play a role, but no microgrip means that we have a bacteria-proof seal. So you will not find any bacteria inside of the implant. Look at the picture here. You see here an implant with a hex, an internal hex. And of course, um, it has some gaps here. Um, when you look at our system, you can see no gap at all. And that's what I'm talking about. The absolutely seal performance with this type of conical connection. And if you don't believe me, go to the Argon company and ask them and they will um, give you all those, <coughs> what we found out over the last years. Uh, sorry that it's written in German, but um, we guarantee you that there is no gap um, with a load from 200 and 200 and newtons. So let me start with the first case. 
so you um, get more into details what I'm, I mean. This is a patient um, that came a couple of years into my office and um, she had pain on this tooth. It's a lower six on the left side. And I told her that we have to remove the tooth and um, she refused and she went to another um, surgeon and he performed um, a resection of the root tip. And that was the result when she returned into my office um, with still having pain. And I told you, okay, now we have to remove the tooth. She refused again. And so we went back again to the guy who did the first root tip resection and he did another one. So um, one year later at about, she came back to my office and the tooth was gone. So she had, um, yeah, two or three th surgeries, absolutely not necessary. And the tooth is, or, is still gone. So when you look at it clinically, it doesn't look that bad, but um, I better make uh, something more diagnostics. And um, so we take uh, CBCT and um, you can see here on the buccal side that we have a, a, a bony defect um, and yeah it looks like um, the situation did not heal very well so um, you can see that here that there's a lot of bone on the buccal missing so and when you open the flap you can see um, the bony defect and um, of course we cleaned the situation completely and um, what we already saw on the CBCT was um, that there's a lot of um, connective tissue inside uh, because the situation just did not heal properly. When you look from the side, you see a spectacular looking defect. But um, honestly, this is a really, really easy defect to regenerate because you have one, two, three walls. You get two teeth in the neighbors so um, there's a regeneration potential from all sides the only thing that is missing here is a little uh, vertical dimension and more um, lateral but as i told you this is really really easy to handle so of course we placed the implant and we augmented the site with allogenic bone i don't know uh, whether you can use um, the allogenic bone, what I'm using in all the countries um, um, where you're seeing me from. Um, but this is only um, allogenic bone. Um, I really like to take materials that resorb completely and have a complete turnover into bone. And that's what's happening with allogenic bone if you treat it the right way. Of course, you have to cover uh, bone substitutes with a membrane. So this is my favorite membrane. Um, it's a demineralized, um, uh, real um, cool um, uh, uh, bone shield. It's getting flexible when you rehydrate it. So this will cover the bone defect completely and it will stay there for quite a long time to make sure that there are no other cells invading my augmentation material. So that's the situation after augmentation and implantation. And what you see here is not the regular cover screw. Um, this is a, a membrane fixation screw. And um, I really love that um, screw because this was not the first time I was uh, placing um, implants like that. And, um, you see how, how deep uh, I placed the implant and what happened um, before I took the membrane fixation screw was that I had to uh, search for my implant uh, in the re-entry for like half an hour because so much bone was over my shoulder. So I thought by taking this membrane fixation screw, it's much more easier for me to find my implant again. And uh, you see here those support screws and um, nowadays this is uh, part of my stable tissue concept. Um, this is the regular um, screw and you can have it in different heights up to three millimeters. Sometimes uh, you need even three millimeters when you bury your implant that deep. So this is here 
um, what I'm talking about, you put the implant uh, down the bone here and you put the membrane fixation, the support screw on top. We always place the implant like two millimeters subcrestally and then you close it up. So this is how it looks like 10 days ago, uneventful healing. This is a um, suture double layer with deep matrix sutures and single knots on top, no vertical releases. So this looks almost in every, in all of my cases like that. And we let the situation heal for like six months. And after six months, it looked like that. And um, you knew, you read that um, specialists in periodontology. So this is uh, something what uh, I do not like. So this is uh, not um, keratinized tissue with a lot of movement um, out of the cheeks. So we have to do some plastic periodontal surgery. So we do a split flap and you see here, we removed all of the um, the, the muscles and, and the, the, the movable connective tissue. So this is, uh, is a, a light portion of the periosteum and um, a little of uh, not moving the connective tissue. And as I wished it to be, I really found quick the membrane support screw. So it was really easy to find the implant. So I do not have I did not have to bury out uh, to to uncover uh, for half an hour my implant to find this system. And this is how it looked like when I removed the screw. This is a little chemnin, and I'm honest, I cannot tell you what it is because, um, yeah, to know what it is, I have to take it out completely and send it to a histological guy, and he can tell me afterwards. But um, of course, I leave that in because this is really, really stable. Um, my thoughts are this is a real dense connective tissue and maybe a, a, a slight mineralization, mineralized part. It's really, really uh, stiff and, and, and stable. This is not the case I'm talking about. This is an um, older case and um, I'm, I want to show you what uh, I do not want today nowadays because those were the old uh, healing screws and I think um, they do not have a good design because we all know that we need to have here in that part of the shoulder in the, tra in the transition zone um, uh, a much uh, an, another design of of the uh, of the um, abutment, and um, in this case with this healing abutment, you um, you kill uh, tissues because you put pressure here um, to the bone, and pressure to the bone means that the bone will go. See that study here um, with those angles. Um, I know that there are a lot of implant companies who are still using. Um, um, healing caps like that and they should look more like that. So you have to have an, an angle less than 15 degrees so that you will not damage the tissues. Um, what you see here is the case um, we were talking about and um, this is not a healing abutment what you can buy from the company. This is a healing abutment what is custom made because um, I was um, not satisfied with the standard parts uh, from uh, the system. So I asked in the company whether they could mill me a custom made healing abutment. And this is what the technician came out with. I told him what I would like to have. And you see, we have a really, really slim design here in the transition zone. And you see how much bone we have on top of our implant. Of course, uh, we had enough time to, to change um, um, parts of the system and that's um, what we did in the last years. And nowadays you can buy um, healing screws that look like this. They are really, really slim here in the transition zone. 
Um, I told the company that we need to come up straight for the first two millimeters, two millimeters, because um, my um, membrane fixation screw has a height of two millimeters. And then we um, go out and, and go with the taper and end up with a diameter of four millimeters. We're not, uh, or I'm not uh, completely satisfied. We're still um, uh, changing something. So the system will get better and better every time, um, the further I get. Look, this is another case, um, what we and how we do it nowadays. You see all those implants buried really, really deep after big bone augmentations and uh, you see how nicely the bone is around the implants and those are the new um, healing caps what i'm talking about so um, i told you that we did not have enough keratinized uh, tissues so this is my standard protocol for cases like that we just harvest a free gingival graft and um, augment it on the buccal side um, to get more stabilized and, and keratinized uh, tissue around the implant. Um, when you do augmentation, either hard uh, um, uh, tissue, soft tissues, you have to make sure that you really stabilize it. It's just like the abutment on top of the implants. It's all about stabilization. So um, if you secure it like I do, you will not lose the transplant. And this is how it looks like two months later. You see the nice volume of the tissue, the nice color, and uh, we are going to do the prosthetics now. And I took out the healing cap. You see how nicely it healed. And this was the impression cope. And that's where the problem started. Um, when I tried to um, insert the impression cope, I did not manage it and I did not understand why. So you can see here on the x-ray, um, I reduced it here in the diameter because I thought it, made, it might be too wide here. It still did not fit. What was the problem? Um, with the old system, um, the healing cap was lying on the shoulder and this made it stop there. Um, and, and with the um, uh, custom-made healing abutment, um, what I took in this case, um, we um, had not um, had any portion of the metal on lying on the shoulder, like the membrane fixation screw, what is in the conical connection. So the impression curve, it's the same um, as uh, the healing cap, the old healing cap, it has a stop here on the shoulder to um, get the vertical dimension when you take the impression. And that was the reason why I could not place the impression cope um, because the shoulder was totally um, covered with this little chimney. So what to do? Um, I called the company and they told me to take this tool this is called a sarcus former. I show it here. It has almost the same design as the, the later abutment should have. And um, with rotating it um, into the situation, you can remove a lot of tissue. And that's what I did in this case. So I removed all the hardly built tissue because I did not understand in advance um, what will happen in this case. So this was a hard learning curve for me. So I could have sent this to the histology guy if I have known that in advance. Of course, we changed all the components. We did not stop um, with the healing abutment. So you can find nowadays our depression copes for um, open or close um, impression taken with the same geometry as the healing cap. So you will not have any problems uh, again taking a perfect impression. And uh, what the CEO of Argon um, managed for me and realized, uh, so we are now in the conical connection and there's no portion anymore lying on the shoulder. And he uh, was able to do that with 
um, um, without uh, touching the conical connection. So you can take it out real easy and it's uh, it stuck into the index real deep in the implant. And that makes it uh, unique, I think. So um, two weeks later, I got uh, the prosthetics components out of the lab and it, real, it healed real nice. But uh, still, I removed a lot of bone, as you could see on one of the pictures. You see here on the right side, the place, the abutment, you see the, the bone that I removed. Hey, let's say this is still a really, really cool picture because I don't know many implants um, who are buried that deep and have that much, much bone around. But look here on the left side. Um, where I did not uh, use the sulcus former, we have a lot of more bone there, which I have to remove to get my impression coping down to the implant. And of course, um, we have um, the prosthetics part as well in the system. So don't worry that we will have any problems like I did have in the past. So this is how my abutments do look like. This is a hybrid abutment. Hybrid means we have um, a titanium um, portion stuck into the implant and a zirconia um, milled and uh, glued together with the titanium part. And um, I, I always do um, custom made parts because that makes it really, really easy for me uh, to handle those uh, cement margins. You see, this is uh, really easy to control. Um, and I'm not a fan of uh, screwing down my um, abutments um, in, in the laterals. It's just my concept. So this is how I do it. And this is how it looks like four years later. And you see how nicely the tissue are still there. Um, the gap I showed you before is completely um, gone. It's uh, some kind of creeping because um, when you put in the abutment uh, with some pressure, you can see always a creeping. And after four years, you don't see any more of the margin. And look at the CBCT we took four years later. And um, you remember the picture um, where I removed all the bone. And after four years, it seems that all the bone is back. And it seems that it's really, really lying tight on the titanium surface of my abutment. And if you don't believe me that it's possible, um, look at this paper. And tells you that remineralization is possible um, and achieved by increasing osteoblast function. Okay, let's talk about reasons for bone loss. Um, of course, uh, the wrong implant system is maybe and probably the the, the yeah the most part of of uh, getting bone loss. Uh, of course, you can screw your cases up by bad prosthetic work. And um, of course, um, what you have to do is a good management of the tissues, soft and hard tissue, because this is, um, um, uh, besides the implant system, uh, one of the major issues for success. Um, we know from Thomas Linkevitius that we have to have um, yeah, real thick um, soft tissues because in thin tissues, you will lose bone. And um, this is his last paper from um, 2018. So it's uh, four years ago. He corrected this number of uh, three millimeters or even bigger. Um, the first study he made, he started with two millimeters. And that's what um, I think is uh, yeah, mainly taken by all the experienced implantologists in the world that we want to have a big uh, portion of thin tissue above our implant. Um, and my uh, thoughts to that is you can have enough tissue on top of your shoulder. Um, this is a really nice uh, graphic from uh, my friend Jorge Campos. And um, yeah, we all agree pretty much that uh, four millimeters of soft tissue on top of your implant is a really, really nice thing to have. And uh, that makes it pretty much sure that you will not lose any bone under that amount of soft tissue. 
I know that not everybody is able to augment soft tissue. This is okay. So maybe you can do it the other way around. So if you have um, not enough uh, height of soft tissue, you can just place your implant deeper, like you can see here on the left side. So and even if you have just one millimeter of soft tissue, you can bury your implant like three millimeters down the bone crest. So you have four millimeters of tissue um, above your implant shoulder because the implant does not matter whether it's bone or soft tissue. It's, it's, it just needs tissue um, because the tissue makes the seal because um, what causes the bone loss around your shoulder uh, is the plug on the implant shoulder. And the deeper it is, the more seal you have and no plug means no bone resorption. And uh, of course, there are some papers that show you that subcrestal place implants show significantly better bone levels after six months. Okay, six months, that's not, it's not a big time, but um, this is um, a direction uh, where you have to, to look up um, because um, subcrestal implants are better. But what we have um, to have in mind um, that uh, two piece um, implants um, have a lot of problems. And by the time where those guys came up with this paper, this is more than 20 years ago, they uh, did not have the implants that we have nowadays. And they had always a uh, big trouble when they placed implants down the uh, alveolar crest. So um, you can't um, uh, generalize it for all type of implants. I told you that we have um, problems with um, uh, flat to flat, so butt joint connections because of the movement of the abutment. And um, you have to have an implant that uh, has a connection that is real stable um, so that it will not cause the bone loss. So um, even with the implant, I introduced uh, to you my implant system, you have to follow rules. Um, the best implant system in the world doesn't mean automatically that you don't have bone loss. You have to follow biology, um, biological principles. And um, if you have just one millimeter of soft tissue and you put it uh, um, here, um, so you have not enough tissue, you will lose bone. Two millimeters are still not enough bone um, tissue above your implant shoulders. This is the first time we can see because um, this is uh, proven by Thomas Lingvitius that uh, three millimeters are enough to preserve bone. And in my concept, you can see um, we really like to have big amounts of tissue around the implants um, and, and the abutment. So what you see here on the left, this is what I'm trying to do in my cases. I bury the implant like two millimeters subcrestally and I try to create a big portion of soft tissue on top. So I have altogether like five millimeters of tissues around my implant. Do we need bone? Yes, of course we need bone. And uh, Spray told us 20 years ago, um, because when you have uh, less than 1.8 millimeters of bone around your implant, you have um, big problems afterwards because the bone will resorb and uh, this will cause the problems. Um, I show you some um, cases how we augment uh, bone. So this is um, something what you all probably know. This is a Curie technique. Professor Curie is uh, one of the greatest surgeons we have in the world. And he was my teacher at the University of Münster when I was a student there. And um, I learned a lot from him, um, but um, I changed a lot from the systems um, because, um, and did modifications because um, yeah, what I'm trying to avoid nowadays is uh, using um, a, a lot of tissues from the patient. So what you can see here, those are allogenic bone plates. They are used the same way um, as uh, Professor Coelho. So we screw them with some screws into distance to the host bone. And what we create there is a chamfer. And I show you those pictures because I want to tell you again, 
what it's all about. It's about stability. Um, Kuri technique works so fine because he has um, um, invented um, a system that is really, really um, stable. So if you put the bone plate here on, on, the, on the outside um, and you can put here some uh, particular bone inside, the particular particular bone will heal really nicely because there's no movement um, from the outside because this is really, really stable. So again, it's all about stability. And that's what we do. We fill the gap with some um, bone chips. Those are allogenic bone chips as well. And um, yeah, if you do things right, it will look like this after eight months. This is perfectly healed and this is no autogenous bone at all, just allogenic bone. Of course, we took some trephines. You see how nicely the bone looks. And we send it to the histology guy and uh, that's what he came up with. Um, he showed us that we had really, really nice bone formation and we had in all the four trephine at least 90% of new vital bone and one of them was 100% um, of new vital bone. So that uh, shows the potential of uh, allogenic bone as well if you got the right treatment option. So I know that not everybody is uh, able to do a Kuri technique. It's very technique sensitive. So what I'm teaching my students in my master class and all the augmentation um, classes that we give um, to use a membrane technique. This is pretty much that what you should start with when you start um, augmenting bone because it is really, really easy to learn. You have no investment for Piezo, for Microsoft or Sonic World, and you have really, really low complication rates when using resolvable collagen membranes. Um, when you use bone substitutes, you do have to use a membrane. That's for sure because we know that um, the, the bone graft will not heal properly without a membrane. What is the task of the membrane? Um, of course, first of all, um, it should protect um, the augmentation material uh, for invasion by uh, non osteogenic cells. Uh, so we, had to, we have to keep um, the, the cells out of the, the augmentation, um, what will not uh, regenerate the bone. And of course, it has to stabilize the situation, like I told you in uh, the first case, I showed you. Um, what kind of membrane you should use, resorbable or non-resorbable? Um, when you look at the papers, um, you can find here that the results of GBR procedures are no more like comparable to um, if, when you use resorbable and non-resorbable barriers. But um, for sure, um, you have to um, uh, say that um, um, non uh, that resorbable membranes do have a, a lack of um, space making ability. So um, when you have to regenerate vertical defects, you can do that uh, with collagen membranes. In my opinion, maybe there are some guys of you who are able to uh, regenerate this with collagen membranes. I am not. And uh, we know that from the papers, uh, when it comes to vertical bone augmentation, um, the most effective uh, GBR method is uh, using a um, non-resorbable PTFE um, titanium reinforced membrane. And this is uh, what I use here in my office. I don't know whether you have those products in your countries, um, but I'm pretty much sure that you have something similar. Um, what uh, I use um, for um, um, regenerate the bone is, of course, 50% um, uh, part of uh, autogenous bone. Vertical bone augmentation works the best when you put autogenous bone inside. 
Um, I'm harvesting it with the safe scraper. This is really, really easy. You just scrape off bone from the area that you want to augment and you can uh, harvest a lot of bone in a short amount of time. And what we do is we mix it up with a bone substitute, in this case with BIOS, because um, the BIOS uh, will keep you the volume over time because um, autogelous bone has the disadvantage um, when you take it uh, particularly that it will resorb really, really quick. So we mix that up with a BIOS 50-50, and that makes me a really, really good um, uh, bone augmentation material to put it under the membrane. And again, you see the membrane here in place, the titanium reinforced um, uh, membrane, and it's uh, uh, yeah tacked with a lot of pins there, there. So there's absolutely no, no movement of the membrane. And uh, last but not least, we cover that membrane with a collagen membrane just to make sure that, uh, that um, in, in case um, of uh, um, uh, improper healing, um, this will not be a disaster because um, the collagen membrane underneath is a little more tissue friendly and helps um, with the healing. So you can see here, that we are able to regenerate um, bone deep things with vertical heights of for more than one centimeters. Uh, we do that in a lot of cases here with simultaneous implant placement of some K3 pros on both sides in the lower mandible. So let me show you another case um, that will show you um, that I'm not only showing easy cases because the one I showed you so far is a really, really easy case. Um, and uh, the question is, does the stable tissue concept work in um, situations that are not that easy? You can see here on the right upper, we have a big, big um, bony defect. Um, when you look at it clinically, it doesn't look that bad. And maybe some of you guys um, would not have the intention to regenerate that um, in the vertical dimension. Um, I always uh, think um, that there is a reason why the bone was there someday. So we always try to regenerate what we are able to do. And when we opened up the flap, it looked really, really bad. We did not have um, only the vertical component. The um, alveolar crest was really, really thin. You see this one millimeter left here. Um, we lifted the sinus here in that part, and what you see here is uh, not regenerated bone after removal of the teeth. So this was all um, full of, of fatty stuff, um, connective tissue, so nothing we could work with. So we cleaned that situation really, really well, and then we started to augment um, the portion, and you see here again, titanium reinforced membrane um, stabilized with a lot of titanium tags to make sure that it's completely immobile. You see, um, you can determine um, how your bone will look afterwards if you do it uh, right. And uh, yeah, we created here something like 10 millimeters in width. So um, yeah. Like I showed you in the case before, um, this is a uh, the wound closure closure um, with deep major sutures and single knots on top, tension free, of course. And that's the whole magic and so simple. Um, if you want to have um, um, a successful augmentation, you have to make sure that you have to close it uh, with no tension. And this will heal, of course. You see how nicely we could regenerate um, that area, um, a lot of bone here in height. And of course, you can see here um, all, all uh, so restored the vertical dimension. So eight months later, it looked like this uneven full healing. And then we were about ready to place the implant. You can see here the regenerate vertical. And um, what I do almost in, almost in all of my cases, so we do a digital planning to place the implant uh, in a perfect prosthetic position. 
you can see here the planning with a computer makes it really, really easy to make sure in advance where the implant um, is uh, sitting right to do um, a perfect crown on top. You can see um, uh, already here that we removed the membrane and the tags. And this is uh, how my bone underneath looked like. Really, really nice bone. And we put in the splint and drilled and set, and set the implant uh, full guided. You can see it here already in place. And you can see how deep we place the implant um, under the alveolar crest because um, by that time I was a little afraid whether we could hold that bone in height. So I um, planned it um, not two millimeters uh, um, deep, uh, we put it three millimeter deep into the bone, um, what was absolutely not necessary. Um, yeah, I'll show you uh, a little later. But you see how nicely the bone is regenerated. Here was nothing and now we have uh, 10 millimeters uh, wide bone and um, the height is uh, like 15 millimeters or even more. You can see here the membrane support screw, the three millimeter, because um, I placed the implant that deep. And we let this implant heal for like uh, three months. Um, and then we have the same problem as in the case before. This is uh, not good seen from a periodontal point of view. So we have a lot of uh, movable tissues from the cheek and not enough keratinized tissue. So we have to do something to change the biology. So we do an apical position flap and create a new vestibular death. We removed the muscles and we moved everything what uh, would could cause uh, moving. So this is uh, a slight portion of connective tissue on top of the periosteum. Same procedure as in the other case, um, by uh, really easy finding the membrane uh, support screw, you find really, really quick the implant. And you can see again here the nice gem that we created with that concept. And then we just put, you can see here, one of the new um, healing caps um, on top of the implant, but uh, then we had the problem because we placed the implant that deep and uh, the, the already um, uh, the, 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 the soft tissue that was here on the palatal side was, was in height that wide. So we had to uh, use a, another um, um, uh, forming thing. Sorry, I have to bring something. Another healing cap. I was really happy to have this one in my office. This is a prototype. We changed the design. And so this is a new design. And nowadays, of course, we have longer healing caps as well. So you will not have the problem anymore by having your implant placed. So even having that much uh, soft tissue on top of it. Um, to increase the keratinized tissue, we harvested a um, free gingival graft from the palate and we played some tetris put it around the implant and, um, and fix it on the buckle um, like in the case before um, you have to make sure that there's absolutely stabilization same for bone and soft tissue grafts it's always the same issue stability is the secret or it's not a secret it will make you make you successful and this is the x-ray directly taken after uncovering um, the implant and putting in the healing cap on it. And you can see how nicely the bone is regenerated, how deep the implant is down in the bone and how nice uh, the bone is around our um, healing cap. So we let this heal for another two months. And after two months, it looks like this. You can see here the regenerated vestibular death. So we have a big portion of thick and keratinized tissue around our implant. So we are ready to take the impression. Um, this is uh, not the, the impression corp what you can buy nowadays. This is um, also a prototype that I used by that days 
we change the design um, again. So this is the impression, silicon impression. And of course, um, if you want to solve the case digitally, you have to change because we also changed the components to do the case um, digitally. We, in this case, we did it uh, analog and digital same way to compare it. And this is uh, really, really a comparable outcome. So you can see here um, the model from my dental technician. And what you can see here that I am creating the emergence profile. Of course, we do not have a round emergence profile because a tooth looks more like that. And this is what I'm creating here in my office. I'm telling the dental technician um, how the emergence profile should look nice. And then afterwards, he's doing his lab work. This is the crown. We're doing it every time the same way. A hybrid abutment titanium portion with zirconia on top of it. Um, of course, um, we have to do some um, more work when the crown delivery is uh, there because, uh, of course, because of the um, emergence profile, what I created on the model, it will not fit in the mouth of the patient. So what I'm taking here is a round diamond burr and I reduce here in that part the soft tissue leaving all this down here by itself it's not necessary but here on top i reduce it so i can put my implant my abutment in place and this is directly after placing you see here the, the little gap um, the, the little margin this was 220 and this is what it looked like in december last year um, and I'm pretty much sure that it will look like this um, in five years again. So when you look at the X-ray, you can see here um, still the nice bone formation around the titanium portion of my abutment. And <clears throat> we have maybe a little bone loss, but not that much. This will stay stable over the time. I'm pretty much sure. I want to show you a last case um, because um, modern implantology is uh, yeah, something um, what I really, really like. And modern implantology is not for me um, taking teeth out and doing nothing, waiting for the collapse of the bone. And I show you how we treat cases um, nowadays if we get the chance to do that. Um, you can see here, um, tooth number six and seven. Um, those are root canal treatments and uh, we cannot keep those teeth. This is a bridge and there's another tooth. So we removed here this part of the bridge um, in order to get our CBCT. We try to remove as much metal in the patient's mouth before we take CBCTs because you get, of course, of course, um, a better um, outcome without having metals in the patient's mouth. This is how it looks like. You see, can see here big inflammation on the root tips, um, and this therefore we decided to take out um, the teeth. Um, maybe uh, some of you think uh, you could have rescued the teeth. Um, maybe that's possible. Um, I show you what's underneath and um, look at this. This is um, not what um, I would like to work with. Um, we removed all the carriers and the old uh, filling portion. So this will be really, really hard to rebuild. And you, I think, in my opinion, you destroy a lot of um, biology um, by saving this tooth because, of course, uh, you would have um, um, removed some of the bone to, to, to um, get a good ferrule effect uh, to restore the teeth. So we decided together with the patient to remove the teeth and um, I'm showing you what we are doing too. And I'm like uh, Leonardo da Vinci's same opinion, simplicity is the ultimate uh, sophistication. And uh, yes, what we did here is after taking out tooth number seven here, we took out parts of tooth number six. What you can see here is called a socket shield. 
Um, unfortunately, we could not do that here on tooth number seven because, um, of course, we tried to um, prepare the shield, but it was movable. So um, a mobile uh, shield, um, you can't uh, use that for a socket shield technique because um, it's still, again, mobility will cause um, or will, will fail afterwards. So this is um, how we do the case. Um, and uh, for those of you who do not know what Socket Shield is all about, um, those really famous guys from Munich came up with the idea for more than 10 years, Markus Hürzler and Otto Zuhr, and um, they invented this technique. And a lot of uh, people after them uh, decided that it's a real cool and good procedure. I'm doing um, socket shields for more than eight years now, and I love the techniques. And I'm pretty much sure that most of you know Howie Gluckman and the group around him. And they um, uh, did some modifications, and, and uh, we have determined rules now and it works really, really good. And uh, rules means that you have to really follow those rules um, here by um, reducing the shield on, onto bone level and, and you have to make it thin in that portion. So of course, uh, this works really, really good if you follow the rules. Um, what you can see here, this is a ozone disinfection. Um, I'm working really, really um, um, uh, often, in, almost all of my ca uh, cases with the gas, it, uh, it makes a, a perfect disinfection of the site and kills everything that does not belong in there. So I told you that um, um, doing nothing is nothing that I would like to do in case like this, because this has nothing to do with modern biology. And of course, um, we do, do here uh, something. So can we do socket preservation? Um, yes, you can do socket preservation. Of course, we have really, really low data and really low evidence. Um, there are many case reports that have the lowest um, rate of evidence. Um, there are no really controlled studies. So socket preservation is something um, that works when you have good concepts. Um, but uh, of course, it depends on, on the surgeon as well. So be careful uh, what you're doing there. And um, when you do immediate implants, this is another possibility. Um, um, I uh, put it into PubMed um, a couple of weeks ago, and those were the results. You have to make sure when you put in immediate implant that you do immediate dental implants. So um, when you uh, miss the dental, you get other implants as well. And this were like oh, a little more than 6,000 results. And um, this is, um, yeah, something you, you can find authors that really put um, uh, immediate implants in favor. And you see um, 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 authors who do not like immediate implantation. So this is not very homogeneous. So um, you have to decide um, yourself, uh, what are you doing? Um, and um, I really like um, the, the, the work of Chen and Buza um, because um, they say that you have pretty much similar results with the delayed or um, simultaneous um, placement. Okay, let's look at this one here first. Uh, we could see on the CBCT that there is enough bone. Um, there was only a lack of uh, keratinized tissue. So this is no big deal to, do an, uh, to put an implant in here um, to um, create a better um, emergence profile and, and higher the portion of um, um, keratinized tissue we just do here in that part in apically positioned flap. And then we can place our implants. This is um, a implant, a, a guide system that I used um, twice. Um, it is it is okay. I would not use it anymore, but for the case it was fine. And we were able to place those three implants um, what we planned digitally in advance. So they are perfectly seated there. And you see here, um, what we did was immediate implant placement right there in the 
perfect um, position and one implant here because this was not a big deal on um, about 10 millimeters of bone in width so just here the little leg of the soft tissue what you can uh, change with a um, easy performed uh, periodontal surgery. So tie that up and then we have to fill all the gaps. This is uh, again, this is only um, um, allogenic bone, nothing else because I want a complete turnover um, in my implants. So this is mixed up uh, with PRGF um, and it heals really, really nice. What we put on top there is uh, something that looks like that. Um, and we put some uh, membranes from patient's blood as well. Um, we, this is what I call a poncho technique. So this is an, a custom-made healing abutment, what I did chair side, and I put um, the fibrin membrane on top. And this is how it looks like we screwed those um, custom-made um, healing abutments done chair side in patient's mouth directly after um, implant placement. And you see, we almost did nothing and it looks really, really nice after three hours of surgery. And look how deep we place the implants and look how nice the bone is around my healing abundance. This is how it looked like the next day. Pretty much uneven for healing. So this is really, really cool how fast it heals. And this is how it looked like three months later when we start with the prosthetic works. So this is really, really nice and well integrated here. Um, this is what I mean when I'm talking about modern implantology. You will not have emergence profiles like this when you take out the tooth and do nothing. You will lose everything here and it's really, really uh, hard to create tissues around implants like that um, by state surgery. So this is how it looks like we, when we took out uh, the individual healing uh, caps. You see how nicely the emergence profile is already formed and this is not a big deal now for the impression. So we did an um, individualization of the impression corpse so um, that we are able to deliver the same information from patient's mouth to the dental technician and um, same he did his, he, he did his um, lab work delivering my um, um, custom-made abutments and my uh, uh, one piece um, emax crowns and this is how the works comes into my office and we see the abutments see how nicely you can control the cement margin now. Of course, here with the round pro, um, profile of um, the uh, healing cap, we have to do some work like I showed you in the case before, again, with a round diamond burr, where we um, created um, an, a nice um, emergence profile and then the abutment was seated. So you can see three neighbors, three neighbor implants done really easy with one surgery. This is from the side and this is directly after cementation three years ago. Look at the bone, how nicely the bone formation is by the time we were placing the crowns on top of the implants. And this is how it looked like three years later. Look at the soft tissue architecture. This is perfect. And those are three neighbor implants. And look at the bone three years later. We did not lose much bone, maybe a little here, but look how nicely all those implants are covered two millimeters with bone all around them. Okay, um, I think, uh, yeah, we are pretty good with my time management. So what can you take home today? Um, I showed you a lot of papers because science is really, really important. Um, when I started um, or when I finished um, my um, 
uh, dental school. Science uh, did not really matter for me. It was boring. But uh, the older I get, science is becoming more and more exciting. And it's for me really, really important. Um, the bone sets the tone and the tissue is the issue. Um, I told you that um, in a working concept, it's really, really necessary to have a good performance in um, bone owned soft tissue augmentation techniques because it's still one of the major issues of um, stability uh, when it comes to um, implant surgery. Um, in my opinion, allogenic material shows maybe better performance than allogenic bone uh, than um, autogenous bone when you treat it in the right way um, i'm doing allogenic augmentation for now for more than 12 years now and i tried almost everything with big big success and we have um, really really cool results by following biological principles what we um found it over the years so of course um yes this is one thing that um is uh, besides bone and soft tissue the most important thing knowledge of about your hardware because you can do surgeries and you can create um um, um crowns like this with every implant um, in situation that are challenging so um if you want to do uh, things like this, you have to know what is um, is your implant uh, able to to work in a biologic way, way. I showed you, so try to work with the biology and not against biology. With this wrong implant system, you will have trouble with the biology. So subcrestal placement of an implant depends, of course, on of the stability of the connection, and therefore I have. Um, to say um, you have to use a really, really stable conical connection. So again, knowledge about hardware is really, really important because you can bury implants that deep um, and get the same results uh, with a flat to flat connection. Um, the self-locking conical connection just prevents the abutments from movement. And um, I showed you in three cases that um, um, the stability is the key for success. It's the key in um, bone augmentation. It's the key in soft tissue augmentation. And for sure, when it comes to the prosthetic work of your implant um, rehabilitation, because movement of any parts in the system will cause bone loss. And this is what we try to prevent. Um, with the system I introduced you and my stable tissue concept, you can make sure that you do not have pressure in the interface. We know that the first two millimeters are the important um, portion of the system. After the two millimeters, it's, it doesn't matter at all. So um, if you do it like the way I show you with the implant system I showed you, you will not have um, trouble putting pressure to the bone because you are not putting pressure. It's just not possible. The stable tissue concept is a concept. So um, please um, do not try to um, do that uh, without knowing about um, the hardware you are using in your office. For sure, I, I wish um, that you would use the K3 Pro system. For me, it's the best implant system in the world and not because um, I'm getting paid by the company because I tried so many implant systems over years and I never saw any implant system that works like that. It's a magic biology, biology um, what you find every time. And this is uh, something what is really, really unique. I don't think you find it in any other implant system in the world like that. Try to start with easy cases, okay? Uh, vertical augmentations are something what you have to be um, aware of. It's not that simple. And the more cases you treat, you better uh, you get, and, and then you can do verticals as well. And with the same um, concept as I showed you in the last uh, uh, 65 minutes, um, it will make uh, sure that you will have a good outcome in those cases. And um, what I'm trying always to do 
is uh, not bothering my um, patients. So uh, keep in mind that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Um, immediate implant placement um, is a really, really cool thing. We do it almost in, in all of my cases where I get the chance uh, to take the tooth out. Of course, we have uh, patients where the teeth are already gone. You have to make big surgery with those patients, but when you get the chance, um, leave those teeth as long in patient's mouths and you can and then make um, your uh, work. Um, so if your German is good enough, um, I invite you to visit my master class. Unfortunately, it's in German. Um, it starts in September, so three parts, um, and we treat um, um, uh, the, the bone augmentation thing first, and then in the second one, we go to uh, soft tissue management, and the third part, we do all the prosthetics. It's six days full of dentistry with a, a lot of wine drinking, in one of the nicest uh, regions we have in Germany. Um, unfortunately, it's in German, but we are um, trying maybe to come up with a masterclass next year for international um, dentists, um, so it will be in English. So um, if you want to join me on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, I would not mind. Um, please um, put a like on my um, Facebook or Instagram and follow me there. I'm showing uh, cases there and um, I'm showing what we are doing here in the office. I hope um, that um, you enjoyed the lecture and now I'm ready for some questions. Um, so let's see where we get some questions here. So first question, so why not build bone and place the implant six months later? And why placing the implant that deep? Is that right? I can't read it because something is covering the question. But I think why placing the implant so deep? So, um, I think you're talking about the first case, probably. So, um, why should I wait? Um, this is a really, really easy case. I'm pretty much sure that um, I will be successful by uh, doing it in a one stage uh, surgery, um, placing the implant and rebuild the bone. There's no need. Um, to um, to place the implant um, at a later moment. And why did I place so deep? Be I told you the last 60 minutes that this is a part of my concept. Um, it doesn't make any sense to place um, implants uh, with the conical connections epicrystally. You, and there are a lot of studies ongoing. Um, and, and you have already a lot of studies that show you that conical um, implants with the conical connections should be placed subcrestally. And it's not that deep, it's just two millimeters. That's what the system or my concept is all about. Place the implant two millimeters uh, subcrestally and create uh, some nice tissue on top of it. How can you probe and check for perim? mucositis periimplantitis probing is impossible with the i can still i can still not read the full question because something from ermos is on top of the question ah okay this is all this is fine thank you um, probing is impossible with the crown in case two um, um Okay, this is something um, what we can discuss. Um, let me ask you a question. Why should I probe? Um, and I can check for mucositis or periimplantitis um, just by watching it. Um, you can see whether there are malformed tissues. So in my opinion, probing is not necessary at all. Um, I think probing um, could cause problems. I know that there are a lot of um, periodontists that will have another opinion, but my opinion is probing 
is not a good thing because um, what you like to have is a connection between um, the soft tissue around um, the the um, zirconia part of your um, um, restoration and by probing it you are destroying the connection so um, i'm pretty much sure that in most or yeah most of my cases we have a, a stable um, formation um, of cells um, covering um, the the surface of my um, individualized zirconia abutment and by taking a probe i'm just destroying it and um, this is why i do not like um, probing my implants um, i think you can do it uh, visually and um, if you have problems um, you can see that and you can take an x-ray so in my office we do not probe implants in the follow-ups so when we see a problem of course but no no probing So this is a question in German. I have to translate it. Why do I do not use allogenic bone using uh, the titanium reinforced uh, membrane? Um, the guy who has a question has a colleague. He's doing the same uh, with allogenic bone and has um, excellent results. Um, yes, um, it's a good question. And we are doing it with allogenic bone as well. But um, um, as you could see in my cases, um, we are doing um, um, a lot of uh, crazy and fancy stuff. And um, yes, we, we, we tried a lot with allogenic bone. And of course, we tried to do a vertical augmentation with allogenic bone. And of course, we do have really, really good results. But um, this is uh, something what I want to see over the time, how it will develop. I do not want uh, to show you concept that may not work. So what I did and showed you here is all what I'm doing since a long, long time. And all what I'm doing is really, really working fine. So doing verticals, in my opinion, the best works with allogenic bone and uh, slow resorbing uh, bone substitute like BIOS. And uh, allogenic bone is a cool stuff and we did a lot of verticals as well. And they work really, really well as well in my hands too. But I do not show you cases because, um, before I have follow-ups um, staying stable for at least five years. So peri-implantitis is only visible with the X-ray? No, not only, um, but it is visible on the X-ray, but you can see it with your loops on. When we control our implants, we do it under the microscope or with big magnification, so we can see um, peri-implantitis. What's your pre and post medication? anti, anti vitamin D, dexamethasone. Um, yes, of course, uh, we do um, pre-medication. So um, there's um, antibiotics for a week. Um, we are... We are checking the vitamin D in every patient that comes to our... Um, Office. We do it here in the office. We have a little device where we can measure the vitamin D. Um, so um, vitamin D is really, really important for us. Um, this is a, a big discussion where we can uh, spend a lot of time, um, but vitamin D plays a big role in my office. And of course, um, when we um, when it comes to surgery, um, we are putting um, um, dexamethasone into the patients because we already took blood from him so we can put something back in here so he doesn't have that much of swelling. 
So we give that directly into his vein. In your opinion, the best to cover fixture with TA, the best for soft tissue healing, then I don't understand that question. In your opinion, the best to cover fixture with TA, the best for soft tissue healing, then what is PUID? Cover, put, put, then put, cover, screw. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Maybe you can uh, ask again, because I don't know what you mean with the, with the second part of the question. Next question, please. Okay, so there are no more questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. So if you have any more questions, just uh, write me an email or send me a message uh, over Instagram. And maybe we'll see us sometimes in reality, maybe next year in the master class. And um, I hope um, you have um, you have had a nice um, afternoon and, um, and you are a little inspired now checking your implant system and uh, maybe the organ system is something uh, what you want to use in the future in your office. Um, I promise you, you will love the magic that will show you the system. Thank you so much. Um, I'm starting with my weekend now and open up a, a nice bottle of wine with my wife. And um, yeah, the sun is shining here in Bielefeld. So good afternoon to everybody and, and have a nice evening. Bye.